the, the last, but the probably not the least. And uh, we have a wonderful uh, guest, Natasha, and uh, so she's going to talk a little bit together, and we're going to have a wonderful uh, time. Thank you very much, Natasha. Let's welcome her. Good afternoon. It is really my great pleasure to be here. I'm uh, speaking last, that's true. And all the important and, and smart things have already been said. So um, uh, I'll try to get, add value to this uh, meeting by focusing on one aspect, uh, which is, I think, quite important when it comes to archives, and it is the, the digital nature of archives. So I will be talking about the digital documentary heritage because almost every archive that we create and collect leads to additional things that get created around it by the scholars. And that often becomes then, even if the archive itself is not digital, the content around that most likely will be digital. So I will be now talking about digital documentary heritage as something that arises from the archive and is part of the archive, but also the importance of keeping access to these digital artifacts over a very long time. Because that's really where the value is. So starting generally uh, with observation that archives are so critical for our civilization because they help us transfer inf information from one generation to another. And it is the engagement around archives that then creates what we call knowledge perhaps, insights, wisdom, the things that we want to share around the, across the generations. And often the archives, as we present them, they have different forms. Physical archives in the digital age are more and more presented in a digital form, if not everything, but at least some things. So I'm showing here one example from the archive, which actually shows the, the, the metadata around it. And the metadata is in a digital form. In fact, the archive is now being talked about on the website, so the website becomes a representation of the archive. So I just want to say, it is the, the richness around almost everything and anything that we collect is in these multiple representations that we create around it. And since we live in a, in a digital age, that's actually the format that's most likely to be. So in this case, we have a metadata which is critical for finding the artifact, um, learning about the artifact. So here is a, often in multiple languages, so here is in English and here, before it was in Korean. So it is the metadata that gives the context or guides the reader um, towards a meaning of the artifact. And of course, above then and beyond then comes the meaning that the, that the user uh, gives to it. And uh, that's why the, both the access and these representations that we give access to are important. So this is what I will be talking about. Uh, we know that more and more of physical artifacts become digitalized. And it is because we know that it's much easier to spread something that's in the digital form. So these are the traditional kind of uh, uh, scanning stations for the, for the books. But nowadays we also have a 3D models of sculptures. So we are not anymore in a 2D, two-dimensional. We are really now becoming brave and uh, in, in embracing the digitization of, of 3D objects, it, or even you know, environments that can be created from multiple digital artifacts. So I will now show you um, an example of a, a very important documentary heritage that was created in Australia. And uh, 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 this is digital heritage uh, uh, done by Professor Rina Tivari at Curtin University. And it's part of the Mission Connect. Extremely, extremely important uh, initiative because it deals with the very painful history of the Aboriginal people. It, it, it deals with the history of a, a stolen generation when the children were taken away and they were put in places they call missions. And so this, problem, this, this uh, initiative is not just about archiving, it is actually a healing process. And uh, what is uh, wonderful about this 
even though these buildings are not there, people who remember, they are creating documentary heritage about these places. And uh, I'm bringing this as an example where, uh, in fact, it is a 3D modeling, um, virtual reality, that is being used to depict the places where these people were. So this is now a collective memory of individuals who went through the same experience. Um, every, we heard earlier about importance of who get access to whom, uh, to, to what, at what time. And um, in this instance in particular, not everything is shared with the public and because the people who live through it don't want it to be shared with the public. So there is a, there is a, there is a notion of, uh, you know, of ethics and sovereignty, uh, who has rights to, to, to share with whom and what time. Now, I'm, I'm coming to this uh, again from another perspective. This is an artifact now extremely rich. There are images behind, and then there is a 3D model, and then there is interaction. All of that is very, very complex. Behind this is a game engine. And to this game engine, you know, every, every youth, uh, every uh, you know, uh, teenager will be able to educate you about the best game engines and the, you know, the best AI that's behind. Now, in the documentary heritage, we borrow these uh, components and we create these experiences. M my point here is that we are transforming and creating it in a very sophisticated uh, digital artifacts. And that requires special care. Because just talking to uh, Irina, I know that the, search, that, the, that the game engine that she's using is already being pulled off the market, which means it will become unsupported, which means that in a couple of years from now, uh, she, she may need to take action. She may need to move it to another game engine, which means there will be an investment in prolonging the life of something extremely important, right? This is, this is really important. It's going to stay important for decades for these people uh, who want to inform the public what happened to them, yet they want to do it in a control way, and technology is going to get in their own way, because the technology is not going to last. So, so there's a technology aspect that we need to uh, worry about. So, so going back to the presentation, uh, uh, <clears throat> As we decide to create a representation of these artifacts, we need to think about what are the critical components that we need to worry about. So we have become quite, quite good, I would say, in maintaining the copies, multiple copies of, say, documentary heritage in a file format. And uh, um, we, all have, we also have learned the lessons. You know, you have to have multiple copies in order to make sure that some of these copies are going to survive. We also have techniques to uh, um, watch whether there is any uh, bit rotting happening, which means that we can replace files if they are not usable anymore. So I would just say that on the stories file, I think we have done um, as much as we could when it comes to the processes and procedures. Also, if you look what's happening, there are fantastic new trends. People are um, now storing information in, in DNAs, for example, or uh, using the lasers to put them in the glass plates. So there are many, many more technologies coming just to take care of core, st storage. Now, the problem is that whatever we store, we will not be able to consume, we will not be able to access and interpret unless there is software. So only when there is so compatible software with the, 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 the files that we store, we will be able to have the digital artifact. And that's the nature of digital ar artifact, that it is fundamentally computational. Uh, we humans cannot read zeros and ones, the encoding, we cannot. We need that software. And the, uh, also, I'd like to point out that when it comes to digital, we can talk about artifact. But in fact, it is about experience. It is the human experience. And often it is visual because it's on the screen. We also know with music, it's audio. And uh, we, uh, we also have other artifacts that are more tactile. So you can hear vibration if you, if you hold onto something. So I just want to say there are these senses that we humans have. And these are the only ways we can experience the digital through our senses. And these senses, of course, can be... Um, 
um, engaged if you have an instrument to, to play this digital artifact. And the instrument is also very complex. It is going to be a laptop or a mobile phone, so there is a hardware with it. With the hardware, there is an operating system, and then there is a software inside. So, so in, in, in essence, um, the digital media is truly very, very uh, flexible. It is uh, very amenable to access and distribution, but at the same time, is very vulnerable because it's dependent of very sophisticated technologies that we have. So uh, um, what I'm focusing on, and I have been focusing on for a number of years now, I used to work for Microsoft Research. For 17 years, I was doing natural language processing, information retrieval, and so on. So moving technology forward constantly. At the same time of working with the preservation uh, com uh, communities, the libraries and the archives, to understand what they wanted to persist, what they wanted to, to, to last. And it was that, that journey that opened my eyes to the importance of software. And so this is what I primarily want to share. Um, I also started the company, Intac Digital, and the company is primarily focused on long-term usage of software. And here I'm showing two documents. They are very different, in fact. One is the, uh, on the left side is something that was digitized. On the right hand side is born digital. But both of them use the same application, the same software. It's a PDF viewer. Yeah? So, so we realize that a software can, has multiple usage. And uh, often different artifacts have the same software. Um, by taking care of the software, often you can, cover, uh, you can achieve the scale. Because one single software, one single Adobe Reader can open millions of documents, one by one, not all at the same time. But I just want to say, having the right, uh, taking the right care of software, we can often um, uh, address many, many issues with the access that exist. And I now want to highlight one problem when the software is not available and what impact it can have. Um, recently, it was in December 2020, when Adobe decided that it's not going to support Flash anymore. And it was really difficult for Adobe to do anything with Flash because it, it was very vulnerable. From a security point of view, it was really hard to manage. So uh, you know, we have to understand that Adobe had to deal with this somehow. And the easiest way for them to deal with it, just to stop it. And not only did they stop uh, supporting it, but uh, they also prevented the players to be uh, part of uh, browsers anymore. So essentially, they instructed everybody, whoever's got a browser, Microsoft had to put the patches in, so no more um, uh, Adobe players within, say, Edge or in Internet Explorer. So any update that you have now for Windows, we try to remove Adobe Player because of the vulnerability, yeah? So I just want to say, this is what happened. And uh, um, I mean, Adobe is still around, so we can still talk to Adobe, if you need to talk to Adobe about the uh, player. But uh, the impact it had on many, many people who uh, created digital artifacts using Adobe um, were affected, and among them is Michael Takio Magruder. And uh, M Michael is, a, artist who has been um, producing digital art for more than 20 years. And so we worked with Michael to understand what was the impact of flash obsolescence on his work. And it has been quite, quite significant because Michael has created many, many uh, digital artifacts that could be played in a browser and created through the textures that, were, that are in a uh, Adobe Flash. So uh, he has an archive of artifacts. This archive is also on the web, so we can browse to the web to see it. Uh, let me just show you. So this is Michael's um, archive online. And if you go on the works, on the internet art, uh, you can find lots of uh, art pieces here. They, they used to be able to just click and run these in the browser. So now the, the one in particular that we were looking at is called Worlds. So the Worlds is a, a, a practically a 3D sculpture 
because it uses a 3D modeling software, Cortana, and the, uh, a, a flash. And then all of this would be a dynamic content. It used to be that he, this link here, view the art, if you click on it, it used to be that you can go and download and play the artwork. And this is where it ends up now. So his whole archive practically is unusable at the moment. Yeah. So working with him, it was very instructive because uh, we thought, what is it that needs to be done in order to revive, or revive this archive? So if you speak with, an art, with artists like um, Michael, they often would have in their studio a, a PC, and on that PC, they can run their stuff. That PC is completely isolated. Um, it may be an old PC, and it will have all software in it. And they will be able to tell you, this is how I want it to be. Sometimes when they have uh, internet art online, they would also go to galleries, and they would bring their PCs into gallery, a uh, museum, and show it. So, so, so there are these hardware plus software packages, if you wish, that are good reference points. And they, they are good reference points in the sense that they give us an example of how the artist thought should be. So the question then was, with Michael discussing, what could we do to move this art back to the internet, from the, from the box that is locked into his studio, to the internet? Because fundamentally, this is the internet art. And at that time, when it was created in 1990s, um, artists um, engaged creating these artifacts because internet was almost like a liberation from constraints they had otherwise. It used to be you had to bring an art into a particular gallery and people had to come to a gallery to see it. With internet, that all changed. With a browser and building things for the browser, they could reach huge, uh, really vast audiences across the world. People could experience art at any time of the day. They didn't have to go to gallery. And uh, artists uh, truly engaged very actively on all sorts of issues through their art. That art is not possible to be seen now anymore because most of them use flash. So it's a really a his historical movement that is out of reach at the moment. So with Michael we discuss, if he wanted to bring it back, how can we use the the information that he's got. And on the list here are the details of how his machine in, the, in his lab looks like. I'm also pointing this out. This is an important metadata. Because uh, artifact could be, uh, of course, uh, you can have a video of it, you can have a, a photo of it, and you can describe it. But this is another part of the description that's also very, very important. So we discussed that we will um, virtualize the software that he needs in order to run the, the, the art, art piece. So virtualization is a technique where we essentially eliminate the hardware. Hardware is not as important because um, we create, a, we have a hypervisor that can talk to the hardware. A hypervisor isolates things from the hardware. And in a hypervisor we can put the operating system and the applications in. So this is innovation in computing, in computer science, that really serves us extremely well. So while we have a problem of digital obsolescence, we also have a solution. And the solution is really to, as far as we can, remove the dependence on hardware we can, which we can break. And then the next thing to do is make sure that installation is equivalent to what it used to be on that original hardware. So that's the job. The job is to have a, we have a reference, and then we create another one that is as close as possible. So what I will show you, um, with, with Michael, we worked on uh, reconstructing his art, but keeping in mind these four things. The quality is about whether this is really the same as it was, as he imagined it. Is it the same quality? And then the stability is whether it's going to be, be, be like that, I mean, whether it can be stably reproduced, so that when anybody who opens the things in the browser can see the same thing. Longevity was very important, because we can do something that may last for two or three years. So we may select some installation 
only for two or three years, and then we need to patch it again. So the question was, what would be the decision to make to create an installation that can last for longer? Keeping in mind that we will have to re revisit it again. But we are trying to extend these stretches. Yeah? And the last one was really the most important. Because Michael said, I don't want my art to be in the box. I don't want it to be in my art studio. I want it back to the world. And so how do we, even if we create these virtual machines, how do we provide the access that is original kind of access from the internet? So these four things were the criteria for what he called a success. Yeah? And the good thing is we have an artist we can talk to, and he can tell us what he thinks is success. Yeah? I just want to say we were very privileged and very lucky that we could do that. Yeah? So essentially what we decided to do on one side is his archive. So this is the, what you saw on the web. Uh, he has documented everything. And he has the files that represent his artifact. And then we create, parallel to that, we create a software library. So these are the, what we call them a readers. This is the software that will read the files and show them to people providing a convenient access. So I will now demonstrate this to you so you, you get a feeling how that actually worked in practice. So from a modern computer, you can now get the files, and the, uh, we already put those files into the installation. So you just go and access remotely the installations in the software library from any modern computer. And you will be able to do this in the browser. So, the, so that the, the, the sense of being it online within the browser is still there, very appropriate for this internet art. So let me just show you. Again, I'm going to go to the browser, and um, um, uh, this is, a, this is a, essentially a portal to what we call software library. So if you have a software library account, you come here and you, you basically log in. And I'm going to do this now, and I'll show you what I have in my software library. Um, there are multiple installations in this software library. So you see all of this, each of these, is a virtual machine. It's, a, it's prepared. And there are different types of virtual machines here. Some of them are very modern, like uh, uh, equivalent to Windows 10, and some of them are very old. Like uh, this one here, for example, this one here is Windows XP. So I'm just going to show you and open you. So we can go 20 years back. And uh, this one for Windows XP was done, in fact, for different, not for the libraries and archives. It was done for um, um, a pharma industry. Because in pharma industries, they have to keep the data that's very, very old. For, and they have to be able to reproduce the studies that are very, very old. So, so this is, for example, um, you will see in a minute the, the um, Windows XP with the, all this uh, you know, glory, if you remember the interfaces. But here we have a very, very old software, which is called Analyst. So this software need to be used to reproduce studies. And I just want to show you uh, uh, this software in particular is uh, at least 16 years old. And scientists can use it just the same way as they used it in the past. I'm going to show you here quickly. Um, so the software is installed. Uh, let me just see whether I can get some information from. I think it's 2004. Yeah. Uh, but let me go back and and show you what I wanted to um, present to you. Okay. So let me just. Sorry for this. If something is. I think I'm, I'm locked out of my login, so it doesn't let me start anything. <laughs> yeah. So, let me just lock out. Okay. It just locked me out because we have a security and you're not allowed to... Um, <laughs> We have very strict security. So here I'm going to show you um, how Michael's art looks like, alive. So this is Cortona 3D, is the software that is used for 3D modeling, and artists can create sculptures. So this particular sculpture here is uh, um, 
composed of a number of uh, individual sculptures, and each sculpture is created from, a, believe it or not, from a world word in different languages. And so you can uh, explore every, each, in each of these sculptures by interacting with it. So the interaction can be here. Say, uh, I can zoom in. I can go in and, and uh, see the details of the sculpture. Um, there is also a sound, but I don't think you can hear it uh, because we didn't get the uh, we didn't get the sound connected to, to the speakers for some reason. But I just want to say um, this is a very rich experience that uh, people can have both in the sound and the visual which unfortunately, as I said, it's not possible anymore because the, the flash is not working. You, uh, in this software library, as, as you could see, one can uh, access different, uh, different uh, virtual machines through different tabs. So in fact, this from the user perspective is basically a browser that shows them the virtual art. Um, we can control the access to this environment. So just as I said, I was locked out for a moment because I, I, I closed before without um, sort of closing everything properly. Um, one can present the work, which is very, very confidential, uh, so that uh, you can track very easily who had access to which document within this environment. So while it looks very easily accessible online, which it is, it is very, very controlled access. So you can create uh, you know, scholarly desktops, if you wish, for people to have access to certain things. Let me just try to see whether I can open this one. Um, this is a, a, another desktop where we have um, multiple other applications. And um, uh, I, saw, I showed some of that uh, last year when we had a virtual conference. Um, thanks to Wayne, we had a number of examples of uh, digital um, artifacts. So I'm going to show you here one uh, which is uh, again provided by Wayne where we had a, a map of Korea, historical maps of Korea. Remember Wayne? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think it was um, maps that uh, you created when you were at Harvard University and uh, some of these maps were sh sh supposed to show historical information but because uh, the information was stored, the maps were stored on the hardware server, and the hardware server was disconnected, then you couldn't show anymore. So this is one example where the artifact, uh, in fact, was affected by the linked data, which was external to the artifact. Fortunately, one of these files, uh, I think, uh, um, Wayne could uh, edit so that we can reconnect with the with a different um, as a server, and that server hosts the historical maps, and therefore now we can see the historical map overlaid on the Google map. So this is one example where the um, um, taking care of digital artifacts involves both taking care of the file, which then has the connection with the server with content, and in this case it's Google Earth because we, we installed Google, Google Earth within this environment so that it, 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 it is a, the version of Google Earth that works, and then we, we can always check that it works with the, with the files, with the maps. And I also wanted to show you here another example of where, say, uh, a flash uh, affected people, not just in digital art, but uh, I'll show you a couple of things that uh, people who created very rich experiences with flash um, unfortunately, we will not, we'll not be able to use any of that anymore. So, um, if you have, sorry, let me just go back to examples. So, here are some examples that normally, if you open a browser, so if I open a, a, a browser, I should be able to see uh, the PDF document in the browser. So, this is an advertisement of the historical movies called, you know, Tudors. So, as you know, there is a whole series of uh, movies, uh, tutors in in UK, and uh, they had um, advertisements about them. Normally, you would be able to click here and start looking at it, but unfortunately, that's not possible anymore because the flash is not running in the browser anymore. So we install here um, Adobe um, a Reader with the Flash plugin, so that we can now use the tutors within this environment. So I can just open it and. Uh, 
let me just show you. So I click on it, and it plays. So again, within this environment, this Adobe player with the flash, you do not want to put it anywhere else because it's vulnerable. It's non-secure. But because we have encapsulated in the virtual machine and we have a safe access, then you can do it. Yeah. So I, I hope I, I, I could I, I illustrate um, we have a good news. I always say this is a good news because we know how to take care of the software. We have all the ingredients in the ecosystem to, take, to do that. The only thing that we have to worry now is about what are the practices? What is it that we need to do to do it in the right way? So I'm just going to, uh, in the next five minutes, just tell you a little bit more about these practices. So, so just like with the archives, in, when we have digital artifacts, we, we, we work on metadata. So we make sure that the metadata is correct, that it's complete, and it's useful. Similarly, we now have to take care of the software. But the software requires a bit more care and that normally requires IT skills. So this is going to be a big decision for the archivists, how they're going to cover that competence. A lot of people try to do it by themselves. From my experience, it's really difficult. The best thing to do is partner with IT people. <laughs> make sure they're your friends and make sure that you work together. Because what they have to do is, it's not just once they create an installation. We need to constantly, constantly take care of this because the security changes, uh, even access, uh, software changes, hypervisor change, everything changes. Yet we need to keep it constant. So it's all about these practices that I'm putting here. It is the practices around remote access, about software hosting, and of course software storage because you have to store all the files. You need to know where your files are and you have the instructions how to install. And uh, another aspect I just want to leave you with, this is the framework that um, I, I like to promote because people often focus then on technical aspects. I showed you the software and people immediately say, oh, this is my biggest headache. No, this is one quarter. <laughs> just, this is so showing. Uh, technical aspect that I just showed you, whether you can virtualize and how you virtualize it, that's one aspect. And there are lots of things to deal with. Picking the operating system, picking the right combination, there's a lot to do. But that's one thing. The second thing is, do you have licenses? And what is the policy around providing access? So this is the, the other, you know, the, the legal part, I call it. And then if you really want to run it as a service, then it's operations. And operations is a maintenance as much as, you know, um, other aspects. Do you have qualified staff? Is it gonna be just IT person, or do you need an archivist plus IT person? Or do you need yet another person, domain expert? Uh, because the domain expert may be somebody in biology or somebody from history or somebody who needs to, to be there to t tell you how this needs to look like. We had an artist, digital artist was our domain expert. And then most of all is this human factor. On the left side, we forget. We forget that we do forget. We don't, if I show you now how Windows, you know, Windows XP looks like, and then you need to start looking even the file system, how to find things. We need to continue educating people about previous software if they need to use it. So the human factor is also extremely important. And the final one in the middle that we in computer science always ignore, the final one is the quality assurance. Yeah? Um, in, in software engineering, you know, we have testing. And you know, test, 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 test. If you're releasing the software, there's a procedure of testing. In IT, there is also a procedure of maintenance. But what we are talking here about is the quality across all of this. Because the quality is gonna be about, is this artifact truly uh, uh, something that you, uh, ex uh, you know, expect to be like, 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 like the way it's shown to you? Um, I just want to say with, the in, uh, with, the, with uh, digital art, what we have learned, the lesson we learned is that the instrument to play this, this um, digital artifact is changing and will continue to change. So the, the, the PC that the artist has, has in, the, in his studio is a very different instrument from the virtual, virtualized environment. And in fact, when we're evaluating the quality of the installation of the virtual environment, we had to make some compromises and we asked the, the, we asked the artist whether the compromise was acceptable. 
So we need to be prepared that things are going to evolve over time. In, in case of technology, this is going to be evolution on technology side, meaning that we will be replacing bits and pieces, hoping that instrument is still going to play. Yeah. So uh, in the final thing, three messages. One is it, one it is about the, the point of uh, um, archive. Archive without software, if it has any digital representation, is not going to be complete. And it's going to be the, the, the integrity of the files and the integrity of the software together. So it's unavoidable in the digital uh, era. It's really unavoidable. Uh, the second thing is we cannot do it alone. The software in particular needs to be taken care of in collaboration with vendors. So we need to be friends with Microsoft and IBM and Apple with everybody who is producing software because we need them. They need to give us licenses. They need to remove the protection on installations because we can't, we can't install if we have authentication keys that we need to ask them for. So we need to really work with them. Yeah? And the, the final thing is it, it's costly. Uh, this is not, uh, people may think browser is cheap, browser is free, no. Um, uh, digital requires uh, infrastructure and it's very sophisticated infrastructure. So there's sustainability on the technology side and then there is economical side. And I would just want to say that the best way to, to secure economical side is to provide value through access. Because if there is access to the archive, that means that there are used scenarios in which it's valued. And some of that value, in some way, will be translated into resources to cover the costs. It could be donation. It could be, I just want to say, if the value is created, then value is going to come back to sustain it. Without access, it's very, very hard. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you very much. I think we have a... Any questions to Natasha? Probably you are all too tired. <laughs> mm. uh, it was really wonderful to uh, wonderful uh, to the remote participants and uh, and the Hanseng University students and from Daegu and and uh, this was a really great conference together and really appreciate from all the way from the UCLA, Helsinki. And you're from Doha or you're from Cambridge? Cambridge. Yeah. Cambridge. And uh, uh, Monday's was so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.